to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 as we hear more of the challenges that Paul is uh, giving to the church in Corinth, some pretty direct and at times hard challenges as he seeks to encourage them to be the people whom God is calling them to be. And so as you're turning there, you know, let me just tell you what we're going to be talking about. Let's talk about uh, running, okay? Let's talk about running. Now, when I say let's talk about running, I'm not talking about putting on our sweat clothes and putting on our uh, sneakers and start running like that kind of running. Uh, This is a picture of my daughter, Kate. She was in a half Ironman a few weeks ago, our oldest daughter, and um, this is at the end. This is at the finish line. Of, the, of, this, of this event, all right? It starts off with a mile and a half swim, then a 50-mile bike ride, and it was like the sun was out. It was baking hot. I mean, I was melting. I was melting. I just, I was exhausted, and here I was. I was just driving from one event to the next, and it's like, man, this is tiring me out. Here she's coming to the end of a 13.1-mile run, and uh, it doesn't even look like she's sweating. At this point, I look like a wet rag. But, uh, all right, you know, so a scene like that, it kind of inspires you, you know, and maybe not to do quite that, but it's like, yes, all right. You know, and, and we read in God's Word a number of passages where it talks about those encouragements to, to run the race. We think of 2 Timothy, where Paul is writing, and he's writing to uh, Timothy, and he's saying to him, I have... Uh, fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. And you just picture this end of the race that he's crossing the finish line and, and there's, such a, there's so much inspiration in those verses and in other verses similar to that. But not only does the Bible talk about running the race well, it also talks about running away from things. And that doesn't sound too inspirational, actually, when you think about it. It's like running away from things. But actually, there are times when it really is critical that we do run away. Or in the words of Paul, flee. And it's absolutely critical that we do so uh, to maintain the direction that God is calling us to go in. As we unpack this passage we're going to be looking at today, you'll see what I mean when I talk about that there are times to run away, to flee. Uh, if we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, starting in verse 12, this is what Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be enslaved by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never! Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you have been bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Now we're going to stop there for right now. But, you know, as we hear that and we try to say, okay, what's the simple message to that? We could, we could simplify it to the point of just saying, Paul is writing to the Corinthian church and he says, don't do that. But Paul's encouragement is not about behavior modification. Uh, and it's not about um, trying to 
uh, make behaviors more acceptable. It comes down to a matter of settling the question of identity. That as he's writing to these people who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ, who are living in a very difficult situation, he is challenging them to remember who they are and who God calls them to be and how he calls them to follow after him. So Paul is having to challenge their notions and assumptions to to seek to change their perspective. And he, and he starts by taking the very words of the, the Corinthian people, where he says, you know, all things are lawful. From their point of view, pretty much everything is wide open. It's possible to do anything you want to do. Now, part of that was because of where they grew up. In, in Greece, the, there was this predominant idea, this philosophy that existed that there was a distinct separation between the body and the spirit, that the body was just a shadow of the reality, which was the spiritual world, if you will. So that that, what we're seeing right now with our eyes is but a shadow of what truly exists in the spiritual realms. Now, the implication of this was that the body didn't really matter. This life to a degree, doesn't really matter because it is just a shadow. It's not the reality. Uh, This idea came from Plato, a philosopher, and and it was very, very popular among Greek thinkers such that the idea was that I could do whatever I wanted with my body. It didn't matter. It's the spirit that matters. It's the spirit that endures. So, yeah, I could treat my body however I wanted. I could do whatever I wanted because as long as it didn't affect my spirit, it's all right. Well, put on top of that, what we've been seeing in the very first verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, that that the people of Corinth, those followers of Jesus in Corinth, were so captivated by their freedom in Christ that they emphasized the fact that they were free, but that didn't really take into account their relationship with Christ. It kind of works like this. When Paul wrote to the church in Rome, there apparently were some people who thought, okay, how's this go? I'm a sinner, but God forgives sin, so then the more I sin the more I experience forgiveness and the bigger God's grace is towards me. So therefore, hey, let's sin like crazy because God's grace is overwhelming. And Paul writes to the church in Rome and he says, that's utterly ridiculous. I mean, I can't even put the number of exclamation marks that would have come after what he said in the Greek. It was just like, no, no, that is not the way to be thinking. And Paul is writing to the church in Corinth and basically he's saying the same thing. He's challenging them as we saw from 1 Corinthians 1 on that a casual view of sin, if you don't take sin seriously, if you don't think about how sinful sin truly is, the the temptation will be that grace is then watered down. It's just something that God is constantly sprinkling out. And therefore holiness becomes dispensable. It's kind of like a habit or a hobby that I pick up once in a while when I want to do it. And if I don't want to pursue it, I don't have to pursue it. And Paul is saying, no, that is not it at all. And we read as through that passage, he asks a number of questions, questions that had a real point and a real purpose of pulling away the veneer that they had covered over uh, their, their lives. And They were peeling back and revealing the reality of what was at stake. I mean, the one question, do you not know that our bodies are members of Christ? That as a follower of Jesus Christ, it's not just about you. There's someone else involved, it's Christ. Uh, Shall we take our bodies and unite them with a way of living, a worldview, a practice, that fashions people into objects to be used and abused? Where's the sense in that? What's up with that? Do you not realize that that bond, the depth of that bond that is formed when, 
when there's that joining that takes place that influences beliefs and actions so that when you buy into the uh, taking this person and using them and abusing them, you're buying into the world system that making that okay. And Paul is saying, no. These questions have a point, and the point is that it does matter what you do with your body. And, and you can see it unfold here. And you go to verse 14, and Paul says, God raised up Jesus from the dead. When the women went to the tomb, the angels didn't say, don't worry about the body, Jesus is alive in the spirit. You'll see Jesus' spirit floating around here any minute now. No. They went to the tomb and the tomb was empty. And they heard those words, why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here, for he is risen just as he said. It was a complete regular resurrection mind, body, soul, spirit, all of it was resurrected on that day. Jesus was completely resurrected. And so our bodies hold the promise that God is redeeming. Like we looked at in Revelation last year, we were looking at those promises actually throughout God's word. But in Revelation 21 where he said, Behold, I am making all. All things new. And that is the promise that Paul is referring to, that when you look at the resurrection, God is going to make all things new one day. And so it does matter, our, our, the way we treat our bodies and the mindset we bring to our bodies and the, and the way we handle our morality as a result of living in these bodies, it matters. It matters also in verse 16 because of creation where Paul goes back to the creation event and he says, where God says, two shall become one flesh. When I'm in premarital counseling with somebody and I'm talking with them about uh, preparing for that wedding day, I said, you know what, we can spend a lot of time talking about the wedding, but my concern is about the marriage that comes after. Uh, I don't want to talk about the event, I want to talk about the lifetime. Because what's happening when two come together and they become one, they become one in heart, they become one in spirit, and and it's that matter of these two forging a life together to reflect a unity that is at a level that is is beyond understanding. And, And he goes, this intimate relationship, that between one man, one woman, coming together in the covenant bond of marriage as husband and wife, those two becoming one makes for that one flesh. So Paul says, what business is it to be uniting with anybody else? But then also, in verse 19, he says it matters the way that you live out your relationship with God in your body and the morals that you apply because it's a stewardship that God has given to you because, as he said in verse 19, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. God's Holy Spirit resides in you. Therefore, your body is, you should be looking at it as holy and and, and as you think about action reflecting belief and belief finding its expression in our actions, well, Paul goes down to Verse 19, as we read earlier, and he said there at the latter part, you are not your own, for you have been bought with a price. So glorify God with your body. And and this refers back to verse 11, if you take a look there, and, and, and Paul is recounting what Jesus Christ did for his people, that how his people through what Christ accomplished, are washed. They're sanctified, that is made holy, that is made uh, set apart for God. Uh, And they are justified. They stand right before the holy God. This is what Christ has accomplished for us. This is what God has done on our behalf. Therefore, you have the opportunity of communicating the gospel and what 
God does to save the whole person, not just part. And so that's why as he's addressing the situation that the Corinthians are facing, he says in verse 18, he gives what's called an imperative. An imperative is is like a command. It is a command, but it has that force. And he says, flee sexual immorality. Uh, In effect, run away from sexual immorality. Don't see how close you can get to it. Don't tr- see where the line is and say, how, where is it acceptable and where it, all of a sudden does it become unacceptable? He says, instead of trying to hug the line, run away from it. Just flee. Don't get near it. And for them, they were used to seeing porneia. That's that word, sexual immorality. They were, they were used to seeing it all around them. For at the top of this hill on, in, in Corinth was this temple given over to the, to the goddess of love, Aphrodite. And at one time there were over a thousand prostitutes working in this, in this uh, temple. And, and there were plenty of other things that were going on in that sea Uh, side city that just pulled and dragged and and tugged at the hearts of the the Corinthians. You could look up to heights. You could look at the city markets. It was all around them. And we can hear this call that Paul sends out, and he says, flee sexual immorality. Flee porneia. And we can say, well, we don't have a temple erected on a hillside overlooking the city of Oshkosh and the Fox Valley. We don't have that kind of situation. No, we don't have that situation, but what we do have is in our back pockets or in our purses devices that we could pull out and with a with a press of a thumb and the flick of a finger on a screen take us to places and pictures and videos and all sorts of things that might have made your average everyday Corinthian blush. We have it all around us. And we can live much like the the Corinthians did who thought they had options. That's why Paul's writing to them. He's saying, no, there, there aren't. if you're following Jesus, follow Jesus. And so to us, we need to hear that there aren't options. You know, you look at that word porneia, and and actually porneia, and that's what it looks like in the Greek, is the word from which we get the word porn or pornography. And, you know, you just think about the influence, and I just want to focus on, on this one aspect of this for a moment, but you think about the influence of pornography and it's, it's relatively safe to say that in a room this size with this many people collected together, somebody's wrestling with it. And, and somehow we're trying to wrestle with, you know, the idea of following Jesus and yet have this compartment in our life and, and say, this is the way I'm going to live when I'm in this compartment and I'm going to live it this way and, and so, in terms of the options we think we have, we can try to hide it. That is, we can go into incognito mode in our browser and, and hide our search history. But really, we know we can't hide from ourselves. We certainly can't hide from God. You know, we can deny it and say that pornography does not hurt anyone because it's just a simple matter of pictures or videos. But the fact is that picture in that video is about some woman, perhaps some man, who's caught up in a a lifestyle where they're being used and, and abused. 
And that's the reality of it. You can put on lots of makeup, but I tell you, it doesn't change the depth of pain in the eyes. Oh, we can try to justify it that porn doesn't damage anything. You know, it's just something that we do on the side by ourselves, whatever. But what about the heart? What about the layers that keep piling on the heart that make our heart that much more unresponsive? The true beauty when we see it. That makes our heart so unresponsive that, that apart from some external stimulation, we just can't, we can't connect with the people around us. Oh, we can think we have options, but really, we all know we don't. And, and frankly, pornography is one facet that needs to be addressed when Paul says, flee, run away from it. Don't brush up close to it. I mean, you take a look at the conversations that are taking place, and not even conversations, shouting matches at times, in our culture, in which the definitions of marriage or relationships are being altered, and there's discussions about gender. And now it's, it's easy. I could... Get us kind of whipped up by just citing plenty of examples here, perhaps, where we just all end up shaking our heads like, oh boy, the world is going downhill. But the fact of the matter is, Paul was writing this to followers of Jesus Christ. And he's saying, okay, you're living in that world. Don't let that world influence you. Well, run away. Don't see how many clicks you can get to that one site that you know exists and then pull back. Don't, don't even go down that avenue. Uh, when it comes to thinking through, you know, uh, the various issues that are in our world today, what's going to be your, what defines the way you look at things? Is it the latest public opinion poll? Or is it the latest wrestling with Scripture and saying, okay, God, I want to make sure that I'm living a life of gracious integrity that speaks truth, but speaks truth in love to a world that needs to hear it. And, and, and we need to hear the truth. Oh, Paul is explicit Flee from anything that twists what God has pronounced as good and beautiful. And when you run from something, you have to run towards something else. You just can't run in circles or run willy-nilly. In a very real way, as you're running away from porneia, you run towards, Paul points and says, you run towards Jesus. You run towards the one whom you claim to be following. And so, yes, even this morning, there are, some of us may be wrestling in one way, shape, or form with, with not wanting to flee, but wanting to see how close we can get. Or some of us are in that point of trying to pull away, trying to run away, and we're just like, I, I don't know what to do next. Well, there's... There's three things I want to toss out here, and there's so much more, and it can take so much more time, too, in processing. But the first thing is confessing, acknowledging the struggle before God, going before God and saying, God, I'm struggling. I find myself not running away from, but running towards it, and I want to run towards you. And I confess as sin the ways in which I have allowed my mind to be shaped. And I've allowed my responses to then therefore be shaped by the world around me instead of your word. And there's a powerful thing in confession. Yes, before God, but even to one another where 
a brother speaks to another brother, a sister speaks to another sister, and, and maybe you're here this morning, you look out and you see that brother over there, you see that sister over there that you know you can trust. And you can go up to them and say, you know, I, I need to confess something. Instead of running away, I've been running towards, and I want to break that. I want to move in the way that God's calling me to go in. And I must confess this. And, and, and what power there is when that sister looks at you or that brother looks at you and says, you know, this is what God's Word says. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sin, God is faithful and will forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Sister, brother, you are cleansed because of what Jesus did for you. And to hear those words spoken by somebody you know cares for you and cares about you, a powerful, powerful effect. Well, then it's a matter of committing and saying, yes, Lord, my direction and the energy of my heart is going to be towards honoring and pleasing you. And so therefore, you know, I want your Holy Spirit each and every day to take your word, drive it home to my heart, and allow me to see what I need to be running away from and how I need to be running more towards you. It is that conscious decision that when you get up in the morning, you say, I'm going to live for Jesus today. I'm going to glorify God. Yes, in my thoughts, in my heart, in my body, in all ways and in all things. And that committed statement of the heart is a powerful way of moving in the right direction. But then there's also the matter of conduct. That you conduct your conduct by maybe establishing healthy boundaries. If you know that for you, late at night, everybody else is in bed, just one more click of the mouse button, one more tap on the finger pad gets you into trouble. Then it's a matter of saying, you know, I need to put up a healthy boundary. Maybe I don't go on the computer after 9 o'clock at night. Maybe I don't go uh, to these particular uh, sites that only lead to other sites that lead to other sites. You know, I don't know what it might be for you in the particular, but we need to be con conscious and thoughtful and saying, God, please help me. And, and looking at a brother or looking at a sister or looking at a group, we have uh, groups of people that meet together and hold one another in positive, accountable relationships to say, listen, iron sharpens iron. We sharpen one another. We encourage one another. We keep promoting and pushing one another to run the way that God calls us to run. So having those healthy boundaries and setting a straight course, perhaps, in which you purpose to do something different. Like when you're driving up 41 and you see the gentleman club being advertised. Use that as a, as a reminder to pray and intercede on behalf of those, those women who put themselves in that position or those men who put those, themselves in that position because maybe no one has ever told them, listen, you are created in the image of God. You have inherent worth. You are beautiful. God loves you. Jesus died for you. Trust in him today. Maybe no one's ever said that to them, except maybe with a shaking finger and a frothing mouth. But they need loving people coming alongside and saying, oh, let me show you another way. Let me show you the way of Jesus. For he wants the best for you. He wants you to experience the fullness of his presence and the wholeness of walking with him. Oh, maybe setting that course straight to run well means passing it on to the next generation. You know, Susan and I, as you all know, or most of you know, we have four daughters. And as they were growing up, tried to put them to bed each night and look at them and say, listen, mom loves you. You know, dad loves you. I love you, you know. 
I want you to know Jesus loves you too. And you know what? God's created you in his, in his image. And, and you have gifts, you have abilities that when you give your life to Jesus, he can use those in such incredible ways. And you'll be so satisfied, so satiated by his presence in your life, it'll be overwhelming. Now, please understand, okay? I'm not perfect. And though that might be a very Norman Rockwell type picture I just painted, there were plenty of times when it's like, just go to bed, will you? Yes, there were moments like that. But we sought to create that environment where, where our girls heard that message consistently. Because where else were they going to hear it? We didn't know anybody else would necessarily in the course of their day tell them that. So we took it upon ourselves and we said, we got to do this because if we don't do it, who else will? And so a matter of conducting our conduct in such a way that we're leading others to follow after Jesus. Oh, it, we live in, an, in a world where 50 years ago, some of the conversations that take place today would never have even been dreamt of. But I'm not even talking about 50 years ago. I'm talking about 20 years ago. Even 10 years ago. Even five years ago. We live in a challenging time, but with the challenge comes the opportunities. An opportunity to live in a definitively different way by our speech and by our conduct such that people will see, yes, we're fleeing from, but we're racing towards. Because we want to run in such a way that when we cross that line, whether it be Jesus coming first or God calling us home, we hear those words, well done, you good and faithful servant. That's the trajectory that I pray would I'd be faithful to in the course of my life, and that's what I pray for us. Because I love you, I love this church, and I want us to see us race together in pursuit of what God's called us to. To run hard after him.